Well, hello. It's extremely lovely to be here in this, this marvelously huge crowd. I don't think any of us probably have ever addressed something that looks quite so like a U2 concert. But uh, it's, so it's exciting to be here. It's very exciting to have you all here. And if I could introduce my two co-panelists. Alexandra Harris is one of Britain's leading cultural historians, an extraordinarily inventive and beautiful writer about weather. Some of you may have heard the other day about the English landscape, about painting, poetry, a fantastically broad range of uh, interests and engagements with life, and uh, has written a wonderful biography of uh, Virginia Woolf, but certainly the best thing I think I've ever read about Virginia Woolf. That's, that's Alex here. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, over on the far uh, right to you is Juliet Nicholson, a cultural historian who's written a series of revelatory books about life in uh, England in the early 20th century, before the First World War, immediately after it in the 1930s, and also a memoir, or a kind of some hybrid between a memoir and a history of the women in her family. And the kind of node, the central point of that memoir is her grandmother, her grandmother, Vita Sackville West. And I'm very, yes, clapping for that, that's very good. <laughs> and it's extremely nice to be here because she is my sister. And it is a rare, rare event that one can be familial like this in such a public setting. And so we're going to discuss today, and if we could have the uh, first slide. Um, we're going to discuss today the scandalous affair between Vita Sackville West, uh, our grandmother. I met a man just now and he said, oh yes, you're those Nicholsons, are you? <laughs> and uh, Virginia Woolf in the, the early 1920s, uh, a pivotal moment for, for, their, for both their lives in a way. Both their lives were changed by it and enriched by it and uh, almost, I think you could say, fulfilled by it. And the outcome, the great outcome of the love affair was the novel that Virginia Woolf wrote at the end of it, Orlando, which really dramatizes the whole deep genetic and cultural inheritance that was embedded in, in Vita's self. Really, it's an extraordinary description of a multiple self the many different beings that exist within a single skin. And, and uh, in a way, for our family, I think it's true that uh, it's the sort of greatest um, accolade that any family could think of having to have Virginia Woolf describe who you deeply are or who your, your grandmother deeply was. So anyway. We will begin now, if I could begin with you, Alex, and just, if you could just say who, when they met first at a, a dinner party in 1922, who, who Virginia was at that moment? This meeting happens at a very pivotal moment for Virginia Woolf. We have to understand that this is not a woman born into money um, and not a woman whose books have been written purely through flashes of genius. She has worked and worked her way up to this moment. So she's born in 1882. Um, so we're now, she's now in her 40s. She's hit middle age. And of course, a good tip for middle age is to have an adventure. Um, so her meeting with Vita is going to be her great middle age adventure. But before we get there, let's think of the young Virginia Stephen with her eyes set on being a writer, and she has to make herself a writer. It doesn't just happen. Um, she doesn't publish her first novel, uh, The Voyage Out, until 1915. 
So just think all through 1909, through 1910, through 1911, still through 1912, she's still redrafting this first novel. She talks about standing up at her desk, working doggedly in the dark. This is a woman who stands up to write because she thinks that's more workmanly, that it's more heroic to stand at a desk than to just sit down like a writer doing nothing. You know, the work of the mind is a strenuous thing with Virginia Woolf. Um, Two great things happen. She publishes her first novel, and she marries Leonard Wolf. Um, her marriage to Leonard Wolf was a thing of great uh, physical tenderness and intellectual stimulus. Uh, Leonard Wolf was a political thinker. He'd worked in Ceylon. He'd written two novels. Um, and he was um, write now writing political philosophy. And don't underestimate uh, the electricity of their exchanges. This is a serious marriage. Um, and whatever we're going to talk about doesn't really, I think, dislodge the absolute centrality of Virginia and Leonard Woolf's marriage. Um, and uh, so, it, in fact, Virginia just says it's a bit of a bore for him. Um, so have we got up to, is that enough to get us to 1924? Oh, she's, oh, she's, so by the time uh, things really start happening in 1925, Mrs. Dalloway is out. This is one big book. Um, so she's suddenly on the cover of Time magazine. She's being courted in America. This is someone who's worked her way up from those dark days standing at her desk. Uh, she's found her voice as a novelist. Uh, and she's ready for some big adventures in life. Okay, so that's, there she is. She's ready and waiting, and Vita rolls in. Juliet. So Vita, in contrast, had grown up in one of the hugest houses in England, 365 rooms, 52 staircases, seven courtyards, 12 acres of roof, as the only daughter of a lord, Lord Sackville. But also, she was the granddaughter of a flamenco dancer who had been born in the slums of Malaga in 1830 to a washerwoman. And Vita's mother was one of the seven illegitimate children of this flamenco dancer whose name was Pepita, who was so wildly, sensuously, sexy, fantastic, that when she pulled the flowers and combs from her hair when she was dancing on the stages of Europe and let this hair cascade all the way past her bottom down to her ankles, men stood and cheered and pulled the hair out of their wives' headdresses and flung them to the stage. So Vita had this extraordinarily exotic sense of herself, part gypsy, part aristocrat in this vast house in the south of England, the only daughter, as I say, and doomed not to inherit because women have to give way to men, and men cousins were to, in, to get this house. So from the word go, she is passionate, disturbed, and a duality of nature that actually Virginia um, later described in Vita's wet manner of dressing um, with the pearls and the beautiful silk shirt on top and the jodhpurs and the sort of dagger stuck in the, in the side of her boots as Lady Chatterley on the top and Mellors beneath. So here was this character very tall with a strangely substantial moustache, two fantastically fierce uh, passionate love affairs with women uh, behind her already in 1922, um, and a wonderful diplomat for a husband. Propriety had been observed in some senses. She was also a writer, um, as with um, Virginia too, but from a very young age. She'd started when she was about 12, so by the time she was uh, in her 30s, which was in 1922 when she met Virginia, she, and she exactly 30 years old, she'd written about a dozen books 
and some of them had been published. And she was quite a commercial proposition for Virginia Woolf, who had a publishing company called the Hogarth Press and was looking for bestsellers. So they met at this dinner party, and what happened next? Well, uh, this is, it's, it's a great... I don't know how much of a cartoon this, this uh, sort of dichotomy between them is. You know, the picture that I get from your description is uh, rather slightly austere, very work-orientated, slightly older, even blue-stocking-y, uh, non... not very sexual person in Virginia. And I, I didn't say that. No, you did it, but I know I'm just translating. <laughs> and, and Vita, what's the, Virginia has some amazing phrase for saying that she's pearl clustered or grape, grape hung pearl. No, no, the grapes are in a cluster. Yeah. Grape clustered pearl hung. So, see, so Virginia meets this grape clustered pearl hung Aristo with a knife in her boots. Anyone would fall in love with that. So, well now, I think, shall we tell, say now, what actually happened in their love affair? Just the evolution of that. Julia, do you want to begin that? Yes, now, as I say, Virginia was, was looking for authors for her publishing company. So they had this dinner and Virginia wrote some absolutely lethal diaries and letters about really how Vita wasn't really up to it, not up to the sort of Bloomsbury uh, elite, this intellectual... She said she wrote with a pen of brass. A pen of brass. A pen of brass. Well, let's hope there are no brass pen holders in this audience. However, um, she did sign her up for a book uh, called Seducers in Ecuador, which uh, Virginia, uh, Vita, a year, a year later after this initial meeting, brought round to Virginia's house in Sussex, arriving with her nightdress, Virginia noticed, wrapped in tissue uh, into, into Virginia's uh, house, which actually didn't have a toilet inside the house. It was out in the garden. No, she did then build one with the money from Mrs. Dalloway. <laughs> That's she right. was called Mrs. Dalloway's Lou. But there was something about um, Vita, which was not just the grape-clustered, pearl-hung sexiness. She had an ability, like nobody else, to listen. And listening in a very busy life uh, is one of the most, remains one of the most loving, giving, flattering, and indeed seductive things that anyone can give anybody. And Vita was a listener, and gradually Virginia was pulled right in and uh, wrote that uh, in 1926, when this love affair between them began, she wrote, Vita was sitting on the floor in her red velvet jacket and red striped silk shirt, I knotting her pearls into heaps of great clustered eggs. There's a theme there, isn't there? Clustered eggs. Clustering. But it's a shame we haven't inherited more of this. I mean, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that Juliet and I were both one sixteenth Andalusian gypsy, would you? Really? It doesn't sort of. The flamenco doesn't quite come out of our pores. <laughs> but but Ju Juliet, did you not go and learn some flamenco? when you were thinking about Pepita? Um, I, I, uh, this is, yes, a slight offshoot. <laughs> but I, d I did indeed go to Malaga to find where Vita's uh, grandmother had been born. And um, it's a couple more. Um, and uh, made a sort of half-hearted <laughs> stab. Actually, here I'm not dancing. I'm trying to indicate that in these very, very poor parts of Andalusia in the 1830s, where Vita's grandmother was born, uh, the, the buildings were so close to each other that you could shake hands from one window across to the other. So it's not me doing a Darcy Bustle or Margot Fontaine. I'm actually trying to show the distance between the windows. Do you want to do a bit now? <laughs> no, <laughs> don't. <laughs> no. Um, what about the love affair from Virginia's side? 
I think there's such a tendency to see Virginia Woolf as an ethereal woman. Um, the most famous photograph of her um, was taken in 1902 and she's in her virginal white lace and she's looking into the middle distance. But this is a woman who writes to me the sexiest prose on earth. Um, and you're talking about the Spanish gypsy inheritance makes me think about the exoticism in Virginia Woolf. Um, she didn't have Spanish blood, but my God, she went trekking on mules through the Sierra Nevada if she wanted to, with Leonard holding a big uh, umbrella over her. But she did it. She'd done it just the year before. And you can feel that in her, in her prose. She tosses off novels like omelettes when she's in Spain. I went to meet a, um, a woman in the Alpujara who remembered seeing Virginia Woolf sunbathing under orange groves. And so this, isn't this a completely different image of her? And I think it's partly why she was attracted to everything that Rita represented. The Spanish part of Virginia Woolf was not natural. She had to work herself up to this kind of travel and exploration, but she really admired it. And she wanted in her prose, and this love affair was going to serve her prose, she wanted that fulsomeness and risk-taking and dashing dare in her sentences. Um, and so... Do you think, can I just ask then, do you think that somehow Vita was a sort of relief from Bloomsbury, from Bloomsbury's high intellectualism, sort of precisionism, that Vita was the kind of, uh, or, or summoned the bodily from Virginia. Well, it was tremendously exciting for Virginia to have something to say to her Bloomsbury friends and family about sex. Because all her life, her siblings and her friends had been talking ad infinitum about who they were sleeping with. And... Virginia Woolf had been quite bored for years um, and had been advising people on, on who they might fall in love with. And so to be able to say that she was in love, to be able to talk flirtatiously about this woman striding across uh, the gates of an of a, of a aristocratic house, this really set uh, Bloomsbury alight. Um, so I think it wasn't only a, a relief, a difference, but a, a giving back. And just yes, but I... I there was a thing, I mean, when they, their love, this love affair, the physical love affair, the actual sex, didn't go on for very long. It was, um, I mean, I don't mean each episode. <laughs> I just mean, it was, it just took place. It's interesting how you know that, Julia. <laughs> Over a couple of years, the intensity of the physicality of it. And partly the reason for that is because Virginia's own mental disposition was so fragile. When she'd had... Um, uh, a, 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 an appalling um, case of, of sexual interference, we don't quite know exactly what, by her half-brother when she was very young. And her mental uh, stability was of enormous um, concern to her husband, Leonard. And also, Vita's um, lustiness uh, was was sort of known about. It was whispered about. She'd had these this tremendous love affair with a woman called Violet Trefusis, who is very very closely related to our dear beloved William Dalrymple, who has seen the sofa on which the um, encounter took place. Many encounters. Um, so Vita's husband Harold was also concerned that Vita and her passion would in some way destabilize or uh, return Virginia to um, mental collapse. And Vita herself was very conscious, too, of the responsibility of awakening in Virginia some kind of semi-insanity through the physicality of this relationship that she herself pulled back, and pulled back by actually going off and having affairs with other women simultaneously. And therein lies v Virginia's problem and possibly the route to Orlando. Before we come on to Orlando, can I just ask how, how risque this was in the 1920s? It seems like extraordinarily transgressive for the 
the Mooris of the time. But was it what many people were doing? Were many people having love affairs like this? No. Um, for male homosexuals, it was much, much more common. I don't think, I don't think that lesbian affairs were very visible. The, um, the Well of Loneliness trial, uh, Radcliffe Hall's lesbian novel, um, was going on while, um, while this affair was, was proceeding. And while Virginia Woolf was writing Orlando, and how Virginia Woolf escaped censorship when a novel in which two women spend a night together, and it's not described at all. That is censored in, in 1920s Britain. So it's really not all right to go public about this. Yes, I mean, part of the way that um, Vita uh, got away with her uh, lesbian affairs was by, by cross-dressing. She dressed as a man in 1919. She would walk with Violet Trefuses, w Will William Dalrymple's auntie, uh, down Piccadilly Circus uh, with violet trefusis in a beautiful, uh, beautiful dress and Vita dressed as a wounded French soldier, complete with bandage and blood stain. And Vita was very tall, very, could get away with being a man and no one, no one gave them a second look. And she would then dash into the uh, ladies' room, men's room in the Ritz nearby and emerge in her own dress and go out to dinner. The two of them are a very respectable pair of friends as a couple. So it was there, I think, uh, sex, uh, lesbianism in, in the 20s was much, much more. Uh, it was sort of easier to get away with somehow. There was an enormous uh, dearth of young men after the First World War. And the, so women naturally formed friendships, and so it was easier to get away with it, and it wasn't strictly illegal, whereas male homosexuality was, of course. All right, so, so it, it's very interesting that, that in some ways Vita, out of love for Virginia, withdrew from the love affair out of apprehension for what it might do to Virginia. Can I just, can I just quote the extraordinary let letter in which she knows what she's doing? She, she writes and says to Vita, I have come to a precipice. What would happen if I went over the precipice called V? And I won't. Um, the precipice called V. The precipice called V. Yeah. Um, but she's also she's writing to the lighthouse. She doesn't want to have a mental breakdown at this moment. She doesn't want her mind to be completely consumed by her love affair because she's got a novel to write. And so uh, how out of this moment and this sort of ending of the affair does Orlando as a novel begin to emerge? How does, how does it turn to that in Virginia's mind first? At the moment when Virginia realizes that having stepped back from the precipice, of course, Vita is going to go off um, and be in love with other women. And so what's Virginia going to do? She's going to write back in, in prose. And January 27, she l takes the lid off her mind and peers into it, looks into the pond of her mind. Is a slow fish rising there, she says. Month later, she sees the glimmer of a novel. Orlando, a nobleman. And she writes to Vita, what if Orlando happened to be you? Uh, the idea starts to form of writing all of history through this one man and woman. And it forms extra specially on a trip to Knoll, a trip to the house uh, that Vita has not been able to inherit. And Virginia Woolf sees on this trip to Knoll all the centuries lit up. We've heard that it was a calendar house with its 365 rooms. It's a house that seemed to embody time. Its long galleries were hung. You should be saying this, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a house that had belonged to Henry VIII, to Queen Elizabeth I. It was a house with centuries of English history just stacked within its walls, absolutely contained within every portrait, every staircase, every tapestry, even every bowl of potpourri, which was 
made in the house to a recipe that had been handed down by one of the retainers, Lady Betty Germain's potpourri from the 18th century, still sat in bowls in every room in the house. It was a house absolutely stinking of history. Um, so what we've got on the screen at the moment, the frontispiece for Orlando. Um, Orlando as a boy there is actually one of the portraits from Noel. Um, so all the stages of Orlando's life are illustrated with, Orla with Rita Sattville West's ancestors as they were pictured in the aristocratic halls of, of Noel. So it's as if she's putting into this one character, all of Rita's ancestors. What if you were your ancestors, all in one organic body, going through 350 years? Yes, it's always occurred to me that Rita's gender uh, ambiguity actually leads Wolf to a kind of time ambiguity. Mm. That the very fact that Vita is not definable in an extremely clear gender role in life, or even a, a social role. She's a grandine, she's a gypsy, she's a, a poet, she's a, a gardener, she's a landowner, she's a, a man, a woman. Actually, that is a route to time fluidity. You know, she just flows across definitions. And there's some very good synchronicity between Wolf's own development as a writer and her To constant toying with identity and the nature of reality and so on, and somehow the embodiment of that in this person, that Vita sort of is beyond definition somehow. And only changes her behavior in response to the social mores she encounters as she enters the 17th century, as she enters the 18th century. She's the same person underneath. She just has to wear a different kind of skirt or pass the sugar lumps to Alexander Pope in a proper fashion. Um, she meets different writers along the way, but she's always, at heart, Orlando. Yes, I think um, one of the other concerns of, of Virginia Woolf in her writing, of course, is is time, and it's the, it's, the double, it's the double thing of time. So while it's constantly trying to transcend time, try, time's so ephemeral, life is so precious, will I ever, ever have time to work out what life is about? What does it mean? Who am I? What, what, what is happening here? With simultaneously, this transcendent, simultaneously, this this minutiae, this sort of Proustian or Wolfian obsession with the moment. So she writes a short story called The Mark on the Wall. It is simply a mark on a wall, and from that mark can she spread out and flesh out an entire story which encompasses sort of the universe and everything else about it. So it's this double thing of focusing right in on, on, on Vita as a person, but Vita, as in Orlando, is transcendent throughout these centuries. And do you know, I think it's partly Vita who helps her to write to the lighthouse, and particularly time passes, that flight through time. We tend to talk about these as completely different phases of life, different novels, to the lighthouse about Virginia Woolf's own family, her past, very elegiac. But what she does in Time Passes, uh, this catapulting, this acrobatics of time, is partly inspired by the ease with which Orlando, the Sackville Wests, uh, seem to go through the centuries. And I also think it's relevant that it was Rita Sackville West who taught Virginia Woolf to drive. Uh, with the proceeds of, uh, the Hogarth Press was doing so well by this point, that with the proceeds um, of the latest book, they bought a Ford. And um, Virginia tried to start driving, but ended up in a ditch very quickly. Uh, so Vita, and, who... And hit a couple of people on um, Albert Bridge in London. Well, just a cyclist. Yeah, just nice. one cyclist, she says. Um, so she needed some help. And of course, there was Vita confidently driving up in her... What car did she have, do we know? Uh, Archie. Um, what was it? Archie the car? It was called it Archie. It has a name. 
<laughs> Archie the car. Okay, so Archie the car drives up, and then to the lighthouse car drives up, and the two women uh, go driving around Britain <laughs> and London. Imagine meeting them both at Oxford Circus. But I, I just well, yeah. wonder, Adam, if uh, you and I, um, uh, as Orlando, sort of in our, in our family, if I could just say that very quickly, sort of achieved a kind of mythical status because, because our father had been a young boy when Vita was having this affair with Virginia. And Virginia became, for my, our father, sort of... I mean, I, I grew up one, always wondering, when I was in a prop fix, what would Madonna do? My father, it was, what would Virginia do? And um, so in our family, this novel had this thing of being a love letter to, to, to Vita. But actually... It's one of those myths that when your parents are no longer alive, you can kind of quite easily say that was absolute rubbish. Do, do, do you want to say a bit about that, Adam? Because I know... Well, I, the thing that I always remember about Virginia's... Well, this is the thing we used to joke about when we were teenagers, uh, how incredibly interested Virginia Woolf was in Vita's legs. That she used to compare... She said that Vita had legs like beech trees... And that, that was one of the most magnificent dimensions of her. And it, there's that, that sort of hugely planted thing that she has. But there is, there is a photo up there of Virginia Woolf with uh, our father, Nigel, as a little boy on the left there, and his elder brother, Ben, who became an art historian later on. And Nigel, Nigel's line, he always was, was a man for line, our father's line, was, was that Virginia always said that nothing existed before it was written down. Nothing exists except in the words with which it is described. I always used to rage against this idea, you know, that somehow existence itself had to be entirely verbal and seen and overt like that, uh, when surely there's so much more to existence than can ever be described. But if you read uh, Orlando, you feel that this is a, a tissue made entirely of words. I mean, of course, it is made entirely of words, but there is a... She wrote it incredibly quickly. She wrote the whole book in six months. And there is a sort of, almost a kind of hectic, archy driving mania, almost, in the way this book runs. Don't you think that? I, d I do think that, and I think she wanted to write it at the top of her speed. At the top of my speed, she says, as I write letters to Vita. It was only to Vita that she got up this, this speed. It's about pace and, and rhythm. Um, and she wanted also to be a comedy. I mean, you talk about the, the legs, and so Virginia Woolf wants to catch those legs in her, in her book, she wants the book to be a whole body, you know, and it's full of body parts. So there's a, um, a problem for Orlando, whose legs are so extraordinary that um, uh, women fall, fall over in, in pursuit of these legs, and men, the me masts at the masthead, sailors, might fall off the mast of a ship because they're so astounded by these legs. So Orlando has to keep them constantly covered because they're such a hazard. Um, so she wants to get these little fragments of life, you know, not a whole body, but these bits and pieces of a body that you pull together into a book that will be a kind of festival. She kept talking about this book as a festival. I feast on it, she says. There's, al there's also something that you, uh, Alex, wrote in, in your book about Orlando, where you said this very good phrase, I think, that the whole book is an exercise in fond punishment. And there were, just if I quote something else, uh, from a letter, I think, from Virginia to Vita, when uh, Virginia says to her, read between the lines, Donkey West, put on your horn spectacles, and the arid ridges of my prose will be seen to flower like the desert in spring, cyclamens, violets, all a-growing, all a-blowing. As if Vita was blind to that. And B Vita's sort of hugeness of presence somehow made her unable to see fineness. So, I mean, is there something patronizing in Orlando? Is she looking down 
on the woman she has adored? Of course. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a, a poem that Orlando is trying to write for the whole novel, that's for 350 years. Now bear in mind that Virginia Woolf is writing Orlando, the novel, in six months. She's quick, she's a professional novelist, she knows what she's doing. Orlando has to struggle for 350 years to write anything worth reading. And it's called The Oak Tree, and it's a little bit too vegetable for Virginia Woolf's taste. Lacks the human interest. Uh, lacks perhaps a central transparency. In the end, the bottom line is that Virginia Woolf didn't think that Vita Sackville West had an intensity at the center of her writing that made it the kind of literature that endures for all time. She was a terrifically important writer in the 1920s. She won the Hawthorne Prize for the land. It was perceived as a great English pastoral, but to Virginia Woolf, too much about compost heaps, uh, too much about vegetables, uh, and didn't get How to, to milk that central goats, edge. I think. How to milk goats, I think there's yes. a section. <laughs> and so, perhaps we could now talk about their life after, afterwards, and so if, if, unless you want to say something more about Orlando now. Well, I, <clears throat> I just wanted to say about Orlando. You know, Orlando did, in a way, come out of um, Vita's rejection of Virginia after their great physical love affair. It waned, and she, Vita had many other girlfriends, and in particular one called Mary Campbell, who was actually happily married to the poet Roy Campbell, but was seduced by Vita. And so in, in, in one sort of immediately biographical, factual way, Orlando came out as a sort of response from Virginia Woolf to try to re-engage Vita in her life and as a sort of what our father has called the longest love letter in literature. But actually, as Alex and Adam just saying now, it, she maintained her, well, not exactly patronizing, but somehow if you read Orlando, not even that carefully. You can see that Virginia, Virginia really knows that she knows that she's, she's the real writer. And there's one just tiny, just a couple of sentences in which she sort of indulges herself, I think, in, in just showing exactly what that is, that she herself is the writer. She says, let us go then. And she's, she's Orlando is talking, but it's really obviously Virginia. Let us go then exploring this summer morning when all are adoring the plum blossom and the bee and humming and hawing let us ask of the starling who's a more sociable bird than the lark what he may think on the brink of the dustbin whence he picks among the sticks combings of scullion's hair what's life we ask leaning on the farmyard gate life 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 cries the bird as if he had heard and knew precisely what we meant by this bothering, prying habit of ours of asking questions indoors and out and peeping and picking at daisies, as is the way of all writers when they don't know what to say next. Then they come here, says the bird, and ask me what is life, life, life. And there are just so many passages through this novel, my copy completely falling apart, like that where Virginia is just off on the wing and her writing is just soaring like that. And uh, it's, it's, our father said that listening to a talk about English literature is like sipping English literature through a straw. What you need to do is go and read the book. <laughs> And Virginia but Woolf said, why would anyone sit listening to a lecture <laughs> when they could be living? <laughs> but the, um, other thing, the other thing about Orlando is that, that her friends, Virginia's friends, were, were quite disparaging about it, weren't they? Elizabeth Bowen, I think, said, what on earth is Virginia thinking of doing, of, of playing this sort of stupid fantasy, really? She, there's greatness in this woman, and we think of her not so much as a novelist, but as a an ever-growing and expanding light in our lives. And, and Orlando was a huge disappointment to those readers of hers. 
It didn't seem serious enough. It didn't seem abstract enough. It was full of personal jokes. And reading novels full of personal jokes is difficult if you're not in on the joke. So it felt a little superior, socially superior, at that first reading. What I think emerged as people read it again and again was how intellectually astounding it is. How each personal joke about the legs, about the great hung plural clusters, was used to make uh, philosophical points about uh, the relationship between men and women, about the continuity of time, about how we might hold 2,061 selves within our single body all at once. And it's actually now emerged as one of the most important experiments in modernist form. So what didn't seem immediately the point of it has, I think, been over time more and more appreciated because Rita brought out in Virginia so much of what she'd already been thinking about, which is to do with the jostling selves. How when we write a letter to Vita and we write a letter to Roger Fry, we're different selves. You're a different self in the country. You're a different self driving or going to a party. And she brought all of that out in Orlando and found a form for it. Yes, and of course, it's, it's fantastically contemporary. I mean, it is what we're all talking about now. We're talking about... Uh, identity and does it matter or why does it matter or how does it matter and the question of tolerance of sexual both promiscuity um, of infidelity and of boundaries all these things getting challenged and eroded broken down accepted tolerated welcomed cheered about all of this is it's just fin I mean if Vita and Virginia could possibly come and sit at this phenomenal festival and just see what is going on in terms of inclusivity, boundaries being broken at every single turn, their own writing being discussed in front of people of all ages, this fantastic youth of this festival, which is so exhilarating for us who are used to not the same thing in the, in the British way of having festivals, this energy. If only they could come and see that, they would be cheering you so much from this platform now, wouldn't they? Someone should write an Indian section, I think, to add to Orlando. Um, but you, I mean, this, this sense of different places existing at the same time is wonderful too. Um, Virginia Woolf looked up at the moon in Russell Square and was electrified to think of Rita existing at the same time fully conscious, an autonomous being, but in Persia. And there is something about that simultaneity of this happening, of Oxford Circus going round and round at exactly the same time, of it all, the life force being in both places. And she manages to find a form for that too. Well, I think the most, you know, the very exciting idea is that someone, maybe someone here, will take the idea of Orlando, take that idea of m melting time, and set it in Jaipur. Can you imagine the fiesta of words that would emerge from that? It would be absolutely magnificent. All right, well, look, I think, unless you have spurning things to say, well, just yes. To, just to finish on your question, Adam, earlier about sort of what happened after the book came out and their affair was over, just to say, well, obviously, Virginia continued to write uh, what, three more novels before, was it? Or t uh, the Waves uh, and the waves and Between then the Acts. The Years and then Between the Acts, but also Flush the Dog, also A Room of One's Own. Uh, so the cross-dressing and the thinking about women's lives in Orlando pours out of that book and into her great feminist polemic, the book to which my students still turn today, A Room of One's Own. And Vita... Uh, also continued to write throughout her life. Not, not, uh, she, ma she managed to, she'd won the Hawthornden Prize, as you say. Uh, but her creativity perhaps found its greatest moment in um, actually not in literature, ironically, but in a garden that she made that some of you may know um, in, in, in England, Sissinghurst, um, 
where uh, I hope you'll all come. <laughs> and um, a, a, an extraordinarily beautiful, and, 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 and it has a much sort of transcendent place, although a garden itself is so fragile. It exists, and particularly at the moment, it seems to have had a flowering. Um, I know uh, we took Willie and Olivia there lo last year. They came to visit it, and it's sort of, it's, it is Vita's greatest achievement, um, and not in literature. I think I can say that without f feeling too disloyal. Would you agree, Adam? And if you come there, you, you'll be able to see the ceilings, which... Uh, Vita described as swimming above us when she and Virginia were in their deepest embrace and the ceilings swam above us. Still there, still to be seen. All right, uh, so shall, if anybody wants to ask any questions, yes, well, the, there's a man down here. <laughs> I think an important thing for this audience, you talked about um, the exoticism of of uh, Vita's background and, and the immediate uh, grandparent of Flamenco, but Virginia had Indian blood. Virginia's great-grandmother was a, a French Bengali from Chandanagar uh, called Madame Blanc de Grandcourt. And the coloring which goes down through those paddle sisters, all of whom have these huge dark eyes. And used to, so Virginia's grandmothers, the paddles, used to speak Bengali and Hindustani among themselves in London society so that no one else would understand them. They wore rakis in their portraits. Um, and, so she, and, she's, and she was very conscious of her Anglo-Indian background, Anglo-Indian in the, in, in, in the non-racial sense, in the sense that um, so many of her family had been in Bengal. Um, and that these six extraordinary sisters, the generation, two generations earlier, one of whom was the, the first great woman photographer, Julia Margaret Cameron, who, who Virginia was so keen on, all saw themselves as, as sort of dislocated Indians who'd, who'd had to come home um, to, to a world that was cold and they didn't know. So, and, and this was something I think that, was, that Virginia was very conscious of and writes about in that essay when she writes on Julie Margaret Cameron, wonderful essay. Um, she writes all about her family's Indian past, uh, but keeps quiet about the actual fact of Indian blood, which she did know. That's, a, that's a fascinating. So we have a, a hand up in the middle there, yes. Hi, my, my question is for Alexandra. Uh, we know that Virginia Woolf had read Marcel Proust and uh, admired his book. Uh, but that, but that, that, did that book in any way embolden her to be more explicit about her sexuality? What well, Proust made her more explicit? Is that the question? Yeah. In did it embolden her to be more explicit about her sexuality in later books? Do you know, um, she admires Proust's sensuality in prose so much that she doesn't actually finish... Uh, uh, Tom Perdue. She reads uh, Swan's Way and that's enough for her because she feels so competitive. She feels, how can I do that? And her sentences, you can feel as, she re as she's reading Proust, her sentences become longer and longer and more luscious. The subclauses multiply in this kind of fertile proliferation. Um, and so she's very aware of wanting to take Proust's uh, sensuality of the mind and, and bring that into her, her prose. So I think in a, at the level of style, it certainly does. I can't, I can't tell you at the level of, of subject matter, but it's a very interesting thought. There's a, there's a, a marvelous moment when uh, Virginia is in a taxi with uh, T.S. Eliot in London. And Virginia says to Eliot, we're not as good as Keats. And Eliot says, yes, we are. This one here, this lady here, please. This one, yes, thank you. Slightly random. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my question is, you know, in their letters, they exchanged, they took photographs of each other. Uh, uh, they, they found it, you know, extremely impossible uh, to, you know, just stay away from each other. So how did it make, how did it make difficult, you know, how, how, 
uh, it emboldened uh, Virginia to write about uh, her sexuality so openly in Orlando and how did it affect her relationship more afterwards writing about it with Vita? Do you want to answer that? I mean, I, I think, ha, as, as I understand it, so having had this great affair, how did they find it able to uh, stay away from each other afterwards? How did they sort of bring it clearly to an end? And also, how did it then affect their, their writing afterwards? I mean, uh, if you could answer about Vita, that is, is Vita's writing in any way uh, lesbian writing? Uh, yes, Vita's, Vita... Um did did write autobiographically, no question about it. Um, and there was a novel that was actually banned um, at the time, censored, because she had allowed the fact to um, emerge through the fiction too transparently, called Challenge. And it was actually not about her affair with um, Virginia, but about her affair with Violet Trefusis, which uh, had finished, really, by 1922. And, um, and it was censored. Um, Vita, Vita had a, 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 a mother, the, the, the daughter of the Spanish flamenco dancer, Vita's, Vita's mother, who, who longed for her daughter to marry a duke and to have a nice house with um, nice Labradors and um, go, go to the theater and, and, and sort of dress properly. And, and if she had affairs, have affairs with men. And, and, Vita, and Vita, even as a child, didn't brush her hair. She dressed up in a soldier's uniform and put putty up the, her friend's sister's noses. She was a rebel. Um, and, and it emerged, of course, in her fiction, uh, but usually with some sort of disguise. Uh, but she also wrote, Vita also, I mean, as obviously Virginia did too, but Vita also wrote biography, history, poetry. Gar she was a journalist. She wrote gardening articles. Um, so her, her outlet for her writing was um, m m very, very varied. One, one very interesting thing about her is that she was extremely right-wing. She wasn't in any way, I don't think, a feminist. She uh, and was extremely conservative with a capital C uh, politically. And so it's often assumed about her that somehow because of her lesbianism, she was a radical, subversive, rebellious figure. In many ways, which in some ways is actually the subject of Orlando, she is profoundly nostalgic for an earlier age of aristocratic order uh, of which or, or in which she would preside. And so I think sometimes people get that wrong about her. And that Sissinghurst, this garden in a, in a ruin in, in the south of England she made, is in some ways a monument to the loss of the life that is celebrated in Orlando. You know, that, that glorious enrichment of the aristocratic life, which by the, the mid-twenties or late-twenties was on its way out. Yes, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with you. But there was also a thing that because she was a woman and she was denied inheriting this great house that we've been speaking of called Knoll, uh, and it had to go to her male cousin, that, that sense of her as a feminist was, is, is actually, is va I find it valuable now. I want to hear her rage about that. So what you're talking about is part of the duality of this human being. She was both things. She was rebellious, but she was also conventional, if you can well, be if both. She, if she'd been a man, she would have been a brigadier in the Kent and Sussex yeomanry. You know, that's, that's where she would have gone. But it says a great deal that their friendship remained so tender right to the time of, of Wolf's death. There was, we've talked about a sort of patronizing element in, in Virginia's sense of her writing, but there was also such love um, after the affair um, and such respect for what um, Rita was building at, at Sissinghurst. Virginia Woolf was hopeless in the garden, by the way, and respected immensely, I think, what Rita was making. Do we have another question? Anybody with their hand up? Can I see anyone with a hand up? There's a lady there. 
Okay, uh, was Vita the true embodiment of the androgynous mind that Virginia Woolf wrote about? Excellent question. Was Vita the true embodiment of the androgynous mind that Virginia writes about? Was she truly the androgynous figure? It's an excellent question. Beautiful question. Yeah. Um, the other androgynous figure in Wolf's mind is Coleridge. Now, can you imagine anything more different from Vita Sattva West than Coleridge? Big, fat, opium, swigging poet. What do they have in common? They have in common um, uh, an extraordinarily dynamic relationship between mind and body, ways of, uh, ways of uh, bringing a physical world up into a dream life. And this, the, think about the relationship between Kubla Khan, um, a kind of great tyrant's palace in a garden, and what Rita Sattva West was making. I think, there's, I think there's something about the relationship between physical creation uh, and feminine uh, dream worlds that they both, they both um, embody for her. What do you think about this? Coleridge was a hopeless gardener. He tried to garden in Nether Stowey, and it just turned into an absolute forest of weeds. And his friends came down and said, look at your garden, it's a disgrace. And he said, that's because I believe in liberty and will not impose a tyrannical order of roses and geraniums when all these weeds of the field can come and find their home here. I mean, I, I, I think on the question of androgyny and the, and the veracity of uh, Virginia's uh, portrayal of it through Orlando uh, I. Vita uh, is questionable. I mean, I, even as we sit here talking now, I wonder how much of a pageant, how much of a performance it was uh, for Vita. Her dressing, it was very self, it was con she was conscious that she was dressing as, as um, Lady Chatterley above and Mellors beneath. It was her uniform she adopted, she strided about, she showed it off. And whether there was a sort of, whether she really addressed the inner truth of what she herself was doing as she proceeded through her life. And actually, in the war, after, the, after Virginia killed herself in 1941, um, as Alex was saying, you know, this friendship that had endured right up into the end of, of Virginia's death by suicide in Sussex, in the River Ouse, in the most terrible manner, and it really shattered Vita. And as the war, the Second World War, progressed in the 1940s, Vita became reclusive and resorted to alcohol, uh, was very unreliable. Her husband would say, please don't have one of your muzzy turns. I can't cope with you. You're out of it. And I think there was some terrible experience, perhaps prompted by the war, as perhaps Virginia's suicide was in part, that made Vita question, am I truly androgynous? Who, who, in fact, who am I? What am I doing here? Um, and her response to that was to, 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 to retreat, to, to really pull right, right back from life. Do you think there's something very special in these two women about their self-sufficiency? Your, your description of, of Vita retreating reminds me of the, the, her being alone in the tower, her writing about great mystics. You know, she's very interested in religious hermits and, and mystics, and that's a side of her that perhaps we haven't brought out enough when we're talking about her striding and motoring, but there's this deep, still core that is very self-sufficient, that is both man and woman. And I think Virginia Woolf, in her writing lodge, out there on her own, at the edge of the lawn, looking over the marsh, has that too. And also, the other aspect of Vita that people never talk about is her great sweetness. She was incredibly gentle, or could be, with the people around her. Everyone at Sissinghurst remembers that. Uh, that remembers her... As a mother, motherly figure, she was a very, very bad mother to our father. But uh, there's, a, there's a femininity to her, real femininity to her, which is a dimension of her seductiveness, I think. The two 
it's not you can't say there's the male seducer and there's the female gardener or something everything genuinely flows between these categories and I think that is that's the allure of the person I think we're very nearly done here time wise so uh, can you please thank these two I mean I've learned a great deal this morning magnificent pair of uh, women writers uh, about uh, our, our family and our national history. So thank you very much for coming too. It's been a complete pleasure.